Uh, I'm privileged to be here tonight. I really am. I'm privileged to be here tonight. It's a privilege. There's a lot of things I could have done with my life. Of course, I wouldn't be alive now if it wasn't for the Lord. And, but there's no greater thing that I can do with this life here in the flesh than to uh, serve Him. He's been good to me. Turn with me to the book of First Timothy chapter 1. And uh, verse number 17. Folks, you'll find if you'll read First and Second Timothy, that it's a, they're two rich books. They're rich. They're rich. And uh, First Timothy chapter number 1, verse 17. The Apostle Paul, a lot of times he'll do this. He just busts out in glorifying God. He does. He just bursts forth in praise and adoration. And that's what verse 17 is. He says, To the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might warst a, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwrecked. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Father, bless the word now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I want to read something for you tonight to, uh, to begin what I'm talking about. <coughs> faith. The faith is the uh, revealed body of truth. That's one definition of it. That means what we believe, all believers have always believed. Um, there is no argument. There is no deviation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the virgin birth. Salvation is by grace, the blood atonement. These things are absolute. If you don't believe them, you're not a Christian. There are things which people don't agree on that are born-again believers. They don't believe on the, they don't, some of them don't agree, agree on the two witnesses. They don't agree in eschatology. They don't agree in polity, church polity, the way the church is organized and so forth. They don't agree in things of that nature. Uh, and some in music, some in dress and what have you. But uh, that's a matter that, uh, that has to be dealt with on an individual basis. But the faith, the faith that was once delivered to the saints, the Bible said that you contend for that faith that's once delivered to the saints. And I can fellowship with a brother or with a sister that doesn't agree with me on every point of these things I'm talking about. Uh, but if, if one calls himself a brother and doesn't believe in the blood atonement, he's not my brother. Amen. Or the virgin birth, you deny the virgin birth, you're not my brother or sister. Forget it. <laughs> The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He actually died. He was buried. Rose again the third day. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. You may be a Christian philosopher. You may lack some of the moral teachings of Christ. You may be a follower of Christ. A lot of that around. But you don't know him personally. But in any event, the faith as it is in your heart. If you're a true believer, you have faith in your heart. The Bible said in Hebrews 11, He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's a faith in your heart. The faith in your heart is built on the body of revelation, the scripture, and your personal knowledge of the Lord. None of us really know how strong that faith is until it's put to the test. We really don't know. But sometimes your faith will be put to the test in ways that you never imagined, and then you'll fail the test. You don't know it until it happens, and then once it happens, then you have to pick up the pieces and go on with your life and live with that from that day on. You don't know how you're going to react. You don't know what's going to happen to you. This happens. This happens to Christians every day. Christians are falling. They're falling into sin. They're falling away from the faith. They're falling and giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons. It happens to people. And so don't boast and don't brag and say it could never happen to you because it can. It could happen to me. It could happen to anyone. But I'm going to read the testimony of a man tonight who's a pastor. I want to read his testimony because it's a very touching thing, very touching. And then I'll get into the message. Uh, he addresses this to a, to a pastor brother, a, a preacher brother that has a website. I just happened upon it by doing research this afternoon. And here's what he says. He said, I just read your message on shipwreck. 
My heart ached as I read it because I am one of the shipwrecked. I will share a little with you and please feel free to share it as you see fit. Just don't use my name, please. I was saved at an early age. I used to preach on the front porch when I was five years of age. My grandmother always called me her preacher boy. I surrendered to the ministry my senior year in high school in 1976. God allowed me to preach in many churches afterwards, perhaps because of my young age. I was on the radio a year later and preached on my own program for a year before going to a seminary. I attended a very conservative Baptist seminary. Following seminary, I was in a full-time pastor's position for three different churches over a 24-year period of time up until 2005. I loved studying and preaching and caring for people. God blessed me with what I believe was a successful ministry. All that is gone now. In 2005, I had an affair. I resigned from the church I was pastoring at the time. My wife of 20 years and I divorced. I did something that I said I would never do. I did those things which I had so warned others of. I sinned not only against the word of God, but against my own words. Two weeks after my resignation, my oldest son, who was 24, died unexpectedly. I cannot help but wonder if it were because of my sins. To make matters worse, I ended up marrying the woman I had the affair with. She was 12 years younger and had twin boys. It was a disaster, of course. We divorced two years later. The suffering that I have experienced since my spiritual shipwreck is indescribable. I have literally had to fight to keep living and going. To a large extent, I have lost a lot of the purpose of my life. Preaching and pastoring were my calling. I knew nothing else. I entered a state of great depression where I could not sleep or eat. I've lost my physical health, which I believe is due to the emotional state and stress that I was under. <coughs> 2005, I was a model of health. Had always been athletic and active and took care of myself, but today I have diabetes, neuropathy, and severe arthritis. Brother, I have not only preached hundreds of times about sin and the consequences of sin, but I have experienced it. Pastors and preachers are just as much, if not more, susceptible than others. I am unable to preach or share my story but please let others know that the word of God is true and that you do reap what you sow. How I wish I had never taken my eyes off the compass. I would so love to be able to go to church and not feel such guilt. I would love to be able to preach and pastor again. But that part of my life is over. I believe more in the word of God and the truth of it more now than ever before. I know I'm probably rambling but one other thing, please encourage the churches and Christians to help the shipwrecked. Please tell pastors and preachers to be compassionate upon those who have fallen. God bless you. Take care. Now that's real. Now what, happens, what needs to happen here, and I don't know if this brother will ever hear my words or not, but what needs to happen here is for God to bring a spiritual Christian into his life and restore him. Amen. He needs a mature spiritual Christian that will set about to see to it that this man is restored because he's a good man. He's a, he's a believer in Christ. He's a real brother. He just messed up. Now it's altogether a different thing tonight as to all, all the things that can, can contribute to why somebody can mess up. But you certainly can. And what he's telling you is, I don't detect bitterness, do you? No, I don't detect bitterness. I don't detect any bitterness. I don't detect any shifting of the blame. I don't detect any of that. I don't detect any going back to his childhood and blaming something that might have happened to him when he was six or seven years old. What I see in this man is complete acceptance of his own responsibility for his actions and accepting the fact now that as he's set aside, he's on the shelf and God can never use him again, but the fact of the matter is God can use him again because God can use him to minister to people who are in the same mess he's in. 
but he needs to be restored. And God has to bring somebody in his life that's able to do that. Now, we've got sledgehammer preachers that all they know how to do is drive you down. We've got other types, all kinds that stand in the pulpit. And a lot of these people are very insecure themselves, so therefore they build themselves up by tearing you down. That's the way the world operates. That's the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. They love to watch you suffer. You know how the old saying is, and misery loves company. And they do. It takes someone who's experienced forgiveness themselves and the grace of God in their life that can minister grace and forgiveness. And without, it, uh, without, it, without, uh, without uh, conveying the idea of, of, uh, con of uh, condoning. Nowhere in here does he want anyone to condone anything that he did. And no one condones adultery or no one condones fornication. That's not the issue. The issue is you're a human being. You're a real living person. And you're susceptible to these things. The Apostle Peter says that if you will keep in mind where you came from and what God has done for you, and how the fact is that the same man or woman that committed whatever you did before you got saved is still there tonight. Which means that all of that is possible again. But what keeps that down is the grace of God working in your life. That new man in Christ, that put on the new man that is renewed in the image of him that created him. Be restored in, the, in your mind, in the, in the newness of your mind. To have the mind of Christ. In plainer words, go to war. Or you may very well fall exactly like this preacher did. No doubt he had prayed with people. No doubt he had tried to restore people. No doubt he had ministered as any pastor does. I mean, I'm a pastor and I can understand how the man feels. A pastor can understand another pastor. I've been at this a long time. And I can understand how this man uh, you know, as a pastor before he fell, what he did and how he, how he lived. And now he's lost his wife. He's lost his testimony. He's lost his joy. He's lost his power. He hasn't lost his salvation. If he's truly born again, those I love, I chasten. And the chastening hand of God sometimes allows you to feel the full brunt of your sin. The full brunt of it. The, the, the uh, you know, where God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He'll let you feel that. To remind you once again of what the, the price that was paid and how great it was to pull you back from where you were. Now he feels all this guilt. He feels guilt. And guilt has, there's a reason for guilt and the guilt is to bring you to repentance. But once you've confessed your sin, repented to God, and he's forgiven you, if the guilt continues, that's the devil. That's the accuser of the brethren trying to destroy your life. Because if Satan can cause you to doubt any of the graces of God, and there are many graces of God. Forgiveness is one of them. Redemption is another. These, these graces of God that are at work in your life, if Satan can get you to doubt them and to doubt the faithfulness of God, then your faith will become shipwreck again. A lot of folks want to come back to the Lord. They want to come back. And they don't have the right, to, they don't have someone to help them. They don't, they, they go to the wrong church or they hear the wrong preaching or for whatever reason. And it hinders them. And they need somebody. This man needs somebody greatly. I'm not saying tonight that he can restore his marriage and his wife will take him back. No. He's feeling the brunt of sin. He's feeling it. I mean, he's paying the price for it. But will it scar him? Yes. But from that scar... The grace of God can really begin to grow and use this man. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about shipwrecked faith. There's some people out of this church right now whose faith is shipwrecked. That's all I can say. It's shipwrecked. Shipwrecked. Now, if you, take, if you gloat in that, you've got a problem. You really do. You've got a problem. If you gloat in someone's uh, lack of faith or lapse of faith... Uh, you've got a problem. You're weak. You are exceptionally weak in yourself. But if you feel a burden in your heart and you come before God and you pour your soul out for them, it's a good indication that the grace of God is at work in your life. And they need prayer, folks. We have folks that used to come to this church that need prayer desperately. And I hope God lays it on your heart to do that. 
So how do you keep from having a shipwrecked faith? Well, that's a different message altogether in itself. But let me give you this, as I said before. Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget what's living inside you. Don't ever forget what it took to change you from what you were to what you are tonight. And don't ever forget the one that keeps you. Don't ever forget that because you can't keep yourself. And it'll make you appreciate the grace of God. It'll make you appreciate it because there by the grace of God go I. And there's a lot of truth in that, an awful lot of truth. A shipwrecked faith is often related to people. Look at verse number 20. 1 Timothy 1, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Who are they? Well, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander. So their faith has been made shipwreck. <coughs> now think about this. Here are two men that probably had personal acquaintance with the Apostle Paul. Here are two men that lived in the apostolic age. They lived in the first century after Christ. Here are two men that aren't that far removed from the actual time the Lord Jesus was on this earth. And yet their faith is shipwrecked. See how quickly it can come? And it can come. And sometimes it will sneak up on you. Uh, there's a lot of things that cause a ship, uh, the, uh, a faith to, to, uh, to, uh, to come apart. Wrong people, wrong places, wrong things, wrong church. Babes in Christ are vulnerable to these things because they don't know. They can be so easily fooled by people who put on a, a Christian charade and smile and talk and, and with all the Christian cliches and come across as a friend and they love them. And, and you know, and I wonder, and most of the time all they're trying to do is manipulate them and use them. There's an awful lot of that kind of thing going on. So uh, a Christian, a, a newborn babe in Christ should come under the prayer of, of mature Christians. I mean, when, when someone is born again here, and you, you know they're born again. I'm not talking about, you know, a profession of faith with no fruit whatsoever. But a newborn babe in Christ, they need you. They need your support. They need your prayer support, and they need your moral support, and they need your physical support. They need you present with them. They need you to pick up the phone and call them if they don't come to church. If you, if they, if you miss them for a few Sundays or something, let them know that you miss them. Send them a card. Encourage them. And the kind of things that make a difference in the lives of, of young babes in Christ. Because we live in a hostile environment to Christianity. It's hostile, folks. It's not indifferent. That passed 20, 30 years ago. It's hostile today. The culture of America is anti-Christ. And, I mean, you just have to accept that as fact. It is anti-Christ. And so, uh, you know, knowing that, you, you equip yourself and arm yourself. And you know how Satan is going to uh, attack you. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter number 5 and verse number 12, it says this about the faith. In 1 Timothy 5, 12, the scripture says, Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Now this means to be condemned. What does that mean? Well, if you're born again, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, Walking in fellowship and walking in communion with God puts a barrier up between you and the assault of Satan. You can build a barrier. You don't build it. The fellowship and communion does. But what happens here, he says, that casting off their first faith, they're condemned. That means that the same problems, the same kind of, 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 of environment that, that consumes people, you have no defenses against it. If you turn away from Christ, what do you have left? And the scripture teaches plainly in 1 John 5 that you can send a sin unto death and you can be brought to that point. You are gradually led into it. So it, folks, it pays to live for the Lord. <laughs> it's a very beneficial thing to live for God. <laughs> it's very good for you. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 8, the scripture says, Now it's Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also, watch this, resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. I mean, have ever heard of John Stossel. All right, he's no champion of Christ. I'm not up here tonight to use him as a witness for the Lord. But John Stossel was taught when he went through college, there is no difference between male and female 
in, in the sense of in the sense of their of their make their their their, their mental makeup, their desires. You know uh, that women can that women can compete and achieve and, and and work in the same way that a man can. He bought it. He believed into it. He bought into it. And then he began to live in the real world, found out that women have different desires than men do. God made women different from men. And he began to realize that uh, by experience that there is a difference. But uh, he came, uh, he was, he, I think he interviewed Gloria Steinem on uh, some of these women who are big in the National Organization for Women, the feminist movement. And what he got from them even to this very day, is that there is no difference, that men and women should be placed in the same environment, and on and on and go on, they continue with their pack of lies and ignorance. And ignorance. And of course, the feminist movement is built upon that. Folks, women are different from men. They're different. They think differently. They act differently. He said that uh, one, one good illustration of that was some children were playing and they had a truck out there and some guns out there, toy guns. You let a child with a toy gun today, they'll throw them in jail. That's how insane this culture is. But these little boys had little squirt guns and cap guns and they had little trucks. And then, there were, and then you had some, some uh, dolls and doll houses and all of that. Well, <clears throat> they put the boys in the room with the dolls and the girls in the rooms with the guns and, and, the, and the trucks. And guess what? The girls didn't want anything to do with the guns and the trucks. And the boys didn't want anything to do with the dolls. You know why? They're different. Even that young, they're different. These people resist the faith. The people who are in charge of social engineering today are opposed to completely to the revealed scripture, the word of God, as it relates to the family, life, salvation, your relationship with God, who and what you are, and what makes you what you are. Teach the little boys to be boys, get them dirty, let them bleed. Teach the little girls to be girls, and let them be, and let them be feminine, and let, them be, and let them be the little girls, and the boys will love the little girls. When the little girls get bigger, the boys get bigger, the boys will love the little girls. <laughs> Instead of the boys loving the boys. They got it all messed up. I've never in my life seen as many men feminized as we've got today in this country. Feminine men. And I don't know of a woman, I've never met a woman in my life who wants a feminine man. <laughs> Doesn't work. But they resist the truth. They resist the faith. They're set against it, diametrically opposed to it. So what do you do with people like that? You preach the word. You preach the word. What do you do with people who want to argue with you out of the Bible? Just preach the book. Well, what if they don't believe the Bible? Preach the Bible. Because it's the sword of the spirit. The book will do the job. I don't preach me. If I tried to preach me, they'd pick me to death. I preach the book. And they resist the truth. The Bible's the truth. So that will destroy your faith. They're reprobate concerning the faith. They are reprobate in the sense that they are completely ignorant and rejected and willfully reject the word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter number 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says this. It says, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Isn't that an amazing thing how the faith of Christ comes down to a practical level? where the man goes out and he earns an income. He comes home and he feeds. He's the breadwinner. That's the term. Uh, when's the last time you heard that word breadwinner? Hadn't it? You know why you don't hear that word? That's not politically correct. Because the term breadwinner in its social connotation means it's the father who went out, came back, brought the paycheck in. They don't like that. I saw a thing the other day where the men now are staying home with the children and the wives are going out working. That's a sickening shame. Now, I'm sure I understand there could be times when the man is physically incapacitated and he can't go out and hold a job down. I understand that. There's always an exception to the rule. But it proves the rule. It is the man 
that goes out and gets a job, whether the woman gets a job or not. The man goes and he gets a job. Why? Because that's part of being a man. That's part of manhood. It's a man that takes a position in the home that's going to be the leader of the home. He's going to see to it his home goes to church. He becomes the spiritual leadership of that house. Why? God holds him first accountable. He holds the man first accountable. Now, if you're a Christian lady and you're married to an infidel, I understand. There's always a different situation. You've got every scenario you can imagine. But if you're a Christian man and a Christian woman, God holds you accountable, sir, for your home. That means that you protect your home. You're the protector of your home. And you protect it against Satan. You protect it against a, a godless, Christ-rejecting government. And you protect it against any other enemy and foe that comes against it. And you supply for your home. You take care of it. And therefore, when you go to bed at night, you can go to bed as a man. You wake up the next morning as a man. You put your pants on the next day as a man. You can live your life as a man, not as an it. Up until I was about 60, I could tell the difference between a male and a female anymore. I don't know the difference. <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. We've gotten so messed up in this country in sexuality. You don't know what you're looking at. You may think you're looking at a man, or you may think you're looking at a woman. But you may, looking at, you may be looking at an it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> let's get off of that and go on. Second Thessalonians 3 says, all men do not have faith. And they don't. They don't. As I just read to you, their faith can be shipwrecked. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked three times. Three times. Shipwrecked. I've been on a ship, spent six months on one. It's quite an experience. It really is. I mean, it'd probably be good for most people if they had a little bit of time. I spent six months on a ship. Six months. And I'll tell you right now, believe me, I was glad to get off of that thing. <laughs> I was glad to get off of it. Nothing against the captain, nothing against them, but I was glad to get off of it. You're out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and you are on that little old tiny ship because I'm telling you right now, that ocean is big. And shipwreck is a scary thing. It means that everything's coming apart. It means that you're going down. It means it's over. If your faith is shipwrecked, that means it's finished. Did you read about the pastor just a few days ago who's going to spend a year as an atheist? Did you read about him? Well, if you dig a little deeper into him, you'll find out that he, was, he pastored a church out in California, and he's been a champion of lesbian and gay rights. So the foundation was already laid. I doubt seriously if he was ever a Christian to begin with. But he's going to spend a year reading Hawking and some of these other atheists and, and to find out what it feels like to be an atheist for a year. Now, of course, you know, if he's truly a, a real born-again believer, he's going to make his faith shipwreck. He's not going to read the Bible. He's not going to pray. It'll destroy him. But I doubt if he's even saved to begin with. I doubt it. Because when you just go boldly against what the Scripture says, you know, you, it's a good indication that you don't know the Lord. He certainly needs prayer. Second Timothy chapter number 2, it says that a false teacher can overthrow the faith. And they can. They can. I've covered a lot of stuff in here in Sunday school about the New Age movement and about the occult world. And I've talked about all this stuff, you know. And a lot of people in the church say, oh, that's not, how relevant is that to me? It's very relevant to you if you get into doctrine that has developed from it that calls itself Christianity. Very relevant. Because it will overthrow your faith. It'll overthrow your faith. You've got to watch this stuff. They're very subtle in the way they do it today. They'll give you a lot of Christian terminology and use words, but it's semantics when they use it. They'll use a word, for example, they'll use the word faith, but it doesn't mean at all to them what it means to you. They'll, need, they'll use the word Jesus, but their Jesus is not your Jesus. You've got to have the spirit of discernment. You've got to know what these people are talking about. What are you talking about? Who do you mean? Define your Jesus to me. You believe in salvation? Tell me what you believe about salvation. And even then, you can't be sure that you can believe them because they're, they're liars and deceivers. Why? Because they've been deceived. So that's a, that's a real issue, the faith. Money 
can turn a person away from the faith. First Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 10, it says this, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The apostle tells them, There are those who think that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. I thought I'd check in on one of the national evangelists the other day. I hadn't heard him in a while. <clears throat> so I listened to what he had to say, and right off the bat, believe me, do you know what he was talking about? Money. <laughs> Money. There are the, see, here's the problem. You've got all these people out here who are looking for something, and they need something spiritual, and all they get is what they see on TV, unless they go to a church, and that's all they hear. And they think the Bible's all about money. <laughs> and that's sad. That's not the faith. If all you, it, listen, a prosperity preacher has got a real problem. Now believe me, I have never known a prosperity preacher that didn't preach his own prosperity. <laughs> it's always his prosperity. They want to turn believers away from the faith. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 8, we read these words. Acts 13, 8, but Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. That's about as wicked and sinister as it gets. They want to turn you away from the faith. In my Christian walk, I've gone through times that my faith got weak. It got weak. There have been times that I got down in my closet, all I could do is cry. And uh, it's hard for a pastor. That happened to me a few years ago. I got down in my closet, shut the door, all I could do is cry. I just cried because my heart was broken and my faith was, was wavering. It was weak. It was weak because what had happened transpired before my eyes that I couldn't do a thing about and had nothing to do with. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Yet it happened, and so I got down on my knees, and I cried, and my faith wavered. I just clutched to what I could, embraced what I knew was true, just a little bit, like a, like a drowning man that can, will grab for a straw. I grabbed a hold of anything, what things that I remembered that I knew were true, I got a hold of them. But I was going under. You're very vulnerable then. You are very vulnerable. It's taken years for God in his way to make himself known to me. And he has his way of communicating. It's taken years for God to build me back up to the point to where I was before all that happened. And I've learned things. I'm not as naive as I was then. I'm not as ignorant about certain things as I was then. I'm not as trusting about some things as I was then. Wiser, I guess you might say. Do I believe in my Lord Jesus Christ tonight? Absolutely. Do I believe he's faithful? You better believe it. Do I believe he'll stick with you through thick or thin? You better believe he will. But he'll let you go through a valley so dark that you don't, you'll never see the light at the end of the tunnel until he shows it to you. He'll let your world collapse around you. And when he pulls you out of that mess, your faith will be stronger. Amen. He uses that to chasten us. Chastening is a good thing, folks. Those I love, I chasten. Chastening is a good thing. Remember this. Chastening is never punishment. Chastening is instruction. God's teaching you. He's instructing you. And he's revealing himself to you. So maybe you're in here tonight. Maybe you're where that preacher was before he got into an affair. Maybe you've allowed yourself to slip further than you thought you'd ever slip. And now you've been thinking about uh, fantasy in your mind, stuff like this. Let me warn you. You can be sure your sin will find you out. You can be sure it will. You, you can be sure it will. Here's the good thing about it. If you'll come to him and draw an eye to him, if you'll confess it, he'll forgive you and he'll cleanse you. He'll restore you. The restoration 
won't be immediate. The restoration is a process. Forgiveness is immediate, but restoration is a process. You didn't get away from him overnight, and you won't come back overnight. A lot of people come down, they'll have a good prayer, they'll feel the guilt lifted, but they don't know what to do when they go back and they, they want to start living for the Lord, but their flesh has such a hold on them that it doesn't want to give up. It doesn't want to yield that hold. And so these bonds, these strongholds that Satan has in your life, not easy to get rid of them. Remember this, you can give place to the devil. Once you give place to the devil, he will become a stronghold in your life. Once, you, once he has made a stronghold in your life, the only way that you can take a fort down is to assault it. That means you've got to assault that stronghold. You've got to go to war with what you know now is in you where Satan is, uh, it has built a stronghold. It's best to stop it when it's a place. What's a place? A place is when you're hurt and instead of giving it to God, instead of pouring your heart out to the Lord, you harbor it, you harbor it, and that hurt begins to fester, and then that hurt festers, and the first thing you know, come out of that hurt, comes, what comes out of that hurt? Bitterness and anger, and then revenge. All that comes out of that hurt, and bitterness and anger and revenge build a stronghold. Satan's good at it, and then he consumes your life with it. And there are those people, there are people alive right now, all they live for is to get back at somebody. That's all they live for. That's a stronghold. Let me tell you what the Bible says. It's a wonderful thing, the book. In Isaiah 44, verse 22, he said, I've plotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Jeremiah 24, 7. And I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me with their whole heart. There is forgiveness. There's forgiveness, folks. There's forgiveness. And if you need to be forgiven tonight, don't go around confessing it to a bunch of people. Don't do that. That's naive. Don't confess to people the depths of your heart. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You confess it to God. God alone. And do it in private. And you can pour your heart out to him. You can confess to, and you need to, you confess to God the depths of your soul. And he will cleanse you, forgive you, and restore you. And give you the strength that you need to go on. I wish I could say to this brother, brother, you're not, your life's not over. Sure, you made a mess of it. Sure, you've got some real scars now and you're going to limp like Jacob did from Peniel the rest of your life. You've been touched in the hollow of your thigh. Your strength has been touched, but you can be restored and you can have joy again and God can use you again. He used him tonight. He used him on the internet tonight. He used him and he'll use him again and he'll do the same for you. There's forgiveness in Jesus. Father in thy holy name I pray. Lord, I know our faith is the object of Satan's hatred. I know he assaults our faith. He wants to tear it down. That's the one precious thing we have that he does not have. That's the one thing that we have that separates us from this world is that precious faith, that that's true faith. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name tonight to glorify yourself. Someone heard this, someone may hear it later, that they need to know that the Lord Jesus went to the cross and shed his precious blood so that they could be forgiven, that they could be cleansed, that they could be restored, they could be redeemed. Blessed be thy holy name. And for Jesus' sake, I ask you tonight. <coughs> Amen.